What's up everyone? Welcome to Hustle is for Life Motivation. Tonight's show is going to be absolutely amazing. The interview that I have tonight, it's been nearly two years in the making. We have a very special guest. He is an international bestselling author. He travels and speaks all over the world. And he actually was the right hand man for some of the most elite people in the personal development and the business sectors. He's worked with Tony Robbins, he's worked with Chet Holmes, he's worked with John Asaraf, and he just recently launched his new book called The Sales Edge, which we will be talking about as well. His name is Gene McNaughton. So without much further ado, please help me welcome Gene to the show. Gene, thanks for being here. Really appreciate your time. Well, I'm grateful, as always, grateful to, to talk with you and so, potentially some new ears that have never heard of me. So very excited to deliver some really usable stuff today. I am really looking forward to this conversation, Gene. We connected before and uh, I, I, I'm just so, so excited to dive deep with you because you have worked with some of the, the most elite people like Tony Robbins, like Chet Holmes, like John Astroff and many others. So maybe we should start there. Maybe you can tell us a little bit about how did you actually get started on that journey and how did you connect with such high level people and got a chance to actually work with them? Well, you know, a little bit about my background. Uh, if you remember the company Talal Gateway Computers. Oh yeah. The box company, even for you younger generation, some of you were <laughs> little kids when you had gateways. Well, that was the first company, professional company I worked for out of college. We were a tiny little computer maker at that time. And there was a big wave in the 1990s of the computer revolution. Well, we were on the front of that. We grew that company in 10 years. I started in 1991. By 2001, we went from 20 million in revenue to 11 billion in revenue and global. And you, wow. you couldn't turn on the TV without seeing one of our ads or one of our commercials. And you know, as part of that, you know, joining a small company that takes off, I was put into a lot of really big positions. Um, I started on the phone selling. I started at the very bottom of the ladder doing the night shift sales department. And, you know, I saw the opportunity, but I worked really hard. I put the hours in. I, I learned how to model and listen to the top performers and start kind of taking a little bit of each of them and putting it into my own sales scripts and what I was saying. And, you know, starting at the bottom and then working my way to middle of the pack and then eventually being the top producer among, you know, 110 sellers. Um, and it wasn't because I was special and it wasn't because I was born any certain way. It was just, I understood this power of modeling that if you find somebody who's done what it is you want to do, then, and you follow what they did and you have the, have that worked into your habits and patterns that good things happen. And I happened to be in a good place, did those things and good things happen. About 12 years after being a gateway, I decided it was time for a change in career. So our company had gotten really big. Our stock price has had dropped from 80 to five and I was on paper I was a multi-millionaire and within nine months it was gone and I realized that it was time for something different and you know I had been a huge fan of Tony Robbins in fact I had gone to his I saw him in seminar I had his CDs I had read all his books and I would use that information I would learn from Tony as I was leading salespeople and teaching people and you know, I, I do believe in the power of intention. I do believe in saying out loud and writing down what your goals and dreams are. And while it's no surprise to anybody that's listening to this right now or watching this right now, but less than 10% of people actually do it. But I had been wired from listening to the, you know, I called them my, my virtual board of directors. And, and I didn't know any of these people, but I had their tapes and CDs in those days. So it was Zig Ziglar, Tony Robbins, Jim Rohn. And then I'd listen to some other ones, but those were the three. And all of them, I looked at what were the common patterns in them. All of them talked about clarity of what it is you want. I remember after I had left Gateway, I was really confused. I was in a, oh, not a dark time, but I was like, okay, what am I going to do with my life? And I remember my buddy of mine, he goes, why don't you do what you teach? And he goes, if you could do anything, what would it be? And I was driving at that time and I was listening to a personal power two from Tony Robbins. And I said, I'd go to work with Tony Robbins. And I, I just said that out loud. Now, 
this is where I, there's no science that can explain this, but five days later, I got a call from an executive recruiter to move to California. I was living in the Midwest, uh, Kansas City, if you know the US, and recruiting me for a job. And I said, I have no desire to live in California. I, I didn't like California at the time because I really hadn't spent much time here. And I was politely ready to disengage from the call. And she said, let me, I'm not supposed to tell you this, but I, I want to let you know who it's for. And she said, have you ever heard of Tony Robbins? And I'm like, you got to be kidding wow. me. And from there, I got on a couple phone calls. It just so happened that he was having a, his signature event, the Unleash the Power Thin event in Orlando. They offered to fly me down. And have you been to an Unleash the Power Thin, Talal? Uh, I haven't, but I'm aware of the event, yes. Okay, that's the firewalk event where you walk on the hot coals. Wow. So I went down and I'm thinking, I got nothing to lose. And, you know, if it works, it works. If it doesn't, it doesn't. But I didn't put all this pressure on myself. I went and attended the event. I walked on the fire. And that moment I was hooked. Hmm. And I had a chance to meet with Tony. He hired me on the spot, moved to California, and spent four, it's just under four awesome years working with Tony and, you know, leading his events and helping his salespeople to sell, whether it's coaching or products or big events. And that's when I got really, you know, I, I, my life was inspiration, motivation, uh, leading the sales teams, but I'd get a chance to go to all the events and it was amazing. And I think my main point here is that, you know, who knows, had I not said that out loud, would, would I have gotten the call out of the blue? I don't know. And, you know, through that, uh, through that relationship, uh, Chet Holmes, you know his name, he wrote the book, The Ultimate Sales Machine. He had been working with Tony. Tony thought it'd be a good idea. Chet and I got together. I realized I, he was just another person at that time. This is 2006. And started to get to know this guy. And I'm like, this guy is brilliant. I mean, he is, he's one of the smartest sales minds and marketing minds I'd ever met. And at that same time, I got introduced through a mutual friend because of where I, I lived in San Diego, California, to John Asaraf. I didn't know John Asaraf from a hill of beans. But I think the main thing, lesson here for everybody is you never know where an introduction can take you. Mm. And what most people do when they meet people is they don't do anything with it. They don't follow up or send a thank you note or send them an email or ask them to go have another cup of coffee. Or it, most people don't do that stuff. And it's just, it's, a, it, it's, it's easy to do and it's easy not to do. But in all of those relationships, I ended up working for two years with John Asaraf, launching a company and called, called uh, One Coach. And shortly thereafter that, I reached out to Chet Holmes to touch base with him. He asked me about if, if you know, I had, he said, you work with large sales forces? Yeah. You work with international? Yeah. He goes, I've got a client I want you to come and join me on. And Little did I know it was legit. And it was a multi, it was a billion dollar company out of Mexico. So I ended up leaving Asraf's company, working with small businesses and going back into really what I had spent most of my career with gateways, working with big companies. And that led to me becoming the president of Chet's consulting division. His book comes out, it goes number one everywhere. And if you haven't, by the way, if you're listening to this or watching this, if you haven't gotten the book, The Ultimate Sales Machine, put that at the top of your list. It's one of the best sales books ever written, everything is still applicable today. And it just, it just seemed like it was one connection led to another connection, but I followed through. I wasn't trying to sell anything, it was just good people dealing with, you know, I tried to be a good person. Um, but that's for everybody here, man. You meet somebody, follow up. You meet somebody, don't talk about yourself, talk about them. Um, that led to, after working with Tony in his, world of, of you know, self-development, and Tony always wanted to get into the business market. Now I'm working with Chet, who did everything in the business market. So I said, why wouldn't it make sense that we combine Chet and Tony and build a program, which we called Business Mastery? And that leveraged Tony's brilliance and Chet's brilliance in sales and marketing, and we launched a brand new program in 2011, so seven years ago, that now is a, I mean, there's five events each year. They're in, we're in London, Australia, Fiji, all over the U.S., um, and help them build that. And then eventually it was like, okay, it's time to, time to fly on your own. Um, Chet got sick. He ended up passing away, as you may be aware. And it was that moment I said, okay, I, I'm going 
I'm going to move from being the, the right hand man to being the, the main man. And I made that jump 10 years ago. And here I am 10 years later. Wow. It's, it's a tremendous story. And the thing that really blows my mind, Gene, is the fact that you are an absolute grandmaster at what you do. You are an expert in sales. You have trained multiple teams uh, you know, of very high level people. You work with Fortune 500 companies everywhere and you help them you know, break their sales uh, records. Like same with Tony, when you went to his company, um, you broke the records there that were established for like three decades. And you were there just for like a few years. So, which is absolutely amazing. But the great thing is that you combine your expertise in the business and the sales sector with the personal development world. And you don't question this. You always say, I don't question the science behind it. I take it, apply it because I know it will help me. Right. But I find that, sorry, a lot of the times what I find is that people, they are an expert at business, but then they find the rest of the stuff is just woo-woo. You know, the law of attraction and all that stuff like meditation and incantation, they're all just, that's just woo-woo. Or otherwise you find people in the personal development world are just not very business-minded. But you seem to have really worked out that unique angle or, or the unique spot where you are able to merge those two absolutely perfectly. Well, it, it, here's the real key, everybody. It, it's all about pattern recognition. And when you're exposed to this, now I'm, I go into different companies, but the movie is always the same. You've got a bunch of salespeople, you got a leadership team, everybody's under pressure to produce more. And it's, it's always predictable. They struggle in getting new business. They struggle in the orchestration of their numbers and their metrics. They struggle in keeping their account. It, it's the same, whether I'm dealing with some of the biggest brand names in the world or brands you haven't heard of. And that's what, you know, having a, a, a broad experience level helps me with. But I hear on a monthly basis from leaders of corporate companies that say, hey, you know, we want all the tactics and the strategies, but leave the mindset piece off. And I tell them every single time, you have to trust the fact that it's the mindset piece that is really what's stopping you from achieving what it is you want to achieve. Now, what I do do, Talal, is I don't use words like law of attraction in the corporate world. I don't use power of intention in the corporate world. I've got to change my language patterns. So you can repackage something so it applies to the environment, but mm. the rhythm and the pattern to get the outcome doesn't change. There's, you know, I can call it goal setting in corporate America or, or in the woo-woo world, we call that intention or exercising the law of attraction. If I said that in the corporate world, they would laugh me out of the building. And it was the same way when I was at Gateway. I would read Tony's content. I read Personal Power, Awaken the Giant Within. I had every CD he ever made, and I listened to that stuff. And I'm not talking about passively. It was in my car every time I drove. It was on my boom box at night when I went to bed. So I, instead of watching TV, I would put in a Tony CD and listen to it until I fell asleep. And I always thought, I don't know if this is true or not, but if I listened to it even when I was sleeping, it would somehow wire my nervous system in my unconscious brain. But ironically, when I would go into the workplace, I was able to just, I could retain the information and between Tony Robbins, Jim Rohn, Zig Ziglar, uh, Dennis Waitley, Les Brown, you know, I'm listening to this stuff. You know, in those days, we didn't have the internet and YouTube. It was, you had to buy the CDs and listen to the stuff. You had to go to the bookstore to buy the book. But the more of that I did, the stronger I showed up in the meetings or on the sales floor or in leading or motivating people. And somebody said, what's the key to how you grew so fast in a big company was I worked as hard on myself as I did on the job. And I had significant competitive advantages against the people who didn't do this stuff. And that's the same thing for everybody that's watching or listening is you work hard on yourself. You read the stuff and you decide out of all the stuff you read, what are the five to six things you're actually going to apply? For example, it is a scientific proven fact that people that have written goals outperform those who don't. So how much more info do you need? How many research reports do you need to sit down in the next month 
and plan 2019 by saying, when I get to December 2019 and my life is ideal, what does it look like? Right? So it's your body's a certain way, your income's a certain way, you're driving a certain car, you have a certain relationship, you have whatever the it things are to you, it, it you don't, like the first guy to the top of Mount Everest till out wasn't just going for a walk that day. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, yeah. But the, it's it's a, one of those situations. It's it, you know the few who do are the ones who make the things happen. So as simple as clarity of what it is you want to do, and then reverse engineering back. Here's the other thing that most people don't get, but you have to get it right now. We tend to overestimate what we can do in 30 days, and we radically underestimate what we can do in 12 months. Mm. This is why a lot of you will set a New Year's resolution, and by March or February, you won't even remember it. But if you grab a journal, here's what I do. I grab a blank journal. I buy it for 15 bucks, 20 bucks, whatever. And I take the first three pages. In the front page, I write, Gene's Outcomes, 2019. And I sit down and I write out, if my life were ideal, one year from now, here's what would be happening. And I try, I lay out everything. I lay it down to the vacations I want to take. I lay it down to the concerts I want to see or what I want my body to look like. I, I write it all out, imagining that it's perfect. And I'm, I'm feeling like, oh my God, I did it. And I write all those things out. Now I've got a blank journal for the rest of the year to track seminar notes or track something that I saw on a, or heard on a podcast or watched on a YouTube video. And I take those notes knowing that I'm wiring my brain to go out and achieve the predetermined goals that I set. And I know that seemed like a lot, but let me simplify it. Get clear on what it is you want, right? You set it out for a year or two years and watch the magic happen. There you go. Yeah, so powerful. And for people in the audience, I will challenge you right now. What is it that you know you need to be working on, but you are not doing it because it doesn't quite make sense to you? Mm -hmm. And you're waiting for some sort of revelation to come through, so 78 makes sense, and then you will decide to apply. But my point is that if you know that it's worked for so many other people and everybody's saying that it works, then why aren't you doing it? Whether that's affirmations, whether that's writing your goals down, like Gene talk about, he actually gave you a whole process that he follows himself. So why aren't you doing it? It's kind of like when you go outside and you feel the wind in your face and you can't then say, oh, this, this is not air. It's not like wind actually hitting me in the face. That doesn't work, okay? There are elite people researchers, scientists who've shown that actually it's air, it's made out of atoms, etc. But you can't then say, well, I can't see it. So it doesn't make sense to me. So I, there's no wind. We don't do that. So why are you doing this in other areas of your life when you know you need to be doing it? Gene, I think what you shared there was absolutely phenomenal. And thank you for the, the whole uh, kind of de deconstructing the whole goal setting and having a journal and how you use it yourself so we can apply it to ourselves. And I know I've actually got a brand new journal upstairs and I'm going to start using that. I've written that down. That's going to be one thing definitely that I'm taking away from this conversation. My, my next question really is around um, what were your limiting beliefs at the time when you decided to leave your actual work and decide to become a businessman because a lot of the people they have they're, they're in the t who's following this this uh show this this youtube channel they're in the process where they want to get better they want to improve they want to launch something they want to add value to people they want to be independent but they have certain limiting beliefs and i know i, I have certain limiting beliefs and they hold me back and I'm sure they hold the people in the audience back too. So I'm just wondering, what were your limiting beliefs at that time and how did you overcome them? Well, one thing I want to just step back, I don't know where I'm video, but when you get your journal, you take that thing everywhere you go. Here's mine. Right. I never know. Talal, you might say something right now that I have to say, time out. I need to write that down. Here's my year right here. And you know what's great? I've been doing this since 1994. I have 24 journals mm, in wow. my house. And it's awesome. By the way, think longer term. So imagine a day when 
you're able to go into your office and you've got a library of the books you've read and then one shelf is dedicated to journals. Mm. And you get to look at, um, you know, what was important to me then? What are some of the things that I wrote down then? What was this, you know, because we have short-term memories, all of us do. Okay, so what was my biggest limiting belief going out on my own? Um, first and foremost is, you know, can I do it? And I look at when you make the decision to leave the security of your base compensation. So most people go to work for a job. They know they're going to get their paycheck every two weeks or every month. In some cases, you've got, if you're in the Americas, you've got health insurance applied to that. It, you know what I mean? So part of working for a company is the security of doing that. What I knew going out on my own is I would be walking the tightrope without a net. And you know, I have kids, I have a family, mortgage, all that stuff. So I, I wished I would have done it sooner, but I know it happened at the right moment that it should have happened. And it, there are, I mean, I'm just being honest with everybody, being an entrepreneur, there can be the roller coaster. I was just talking to Talal about that prior to our call. Like there are sometimes it's, it can be feast and famine and you've got to be mentally and emotionally prepared for that. You could start off and things go like gangbusters and you've got clients and you're selling your stuff and the money's coming in. And here's the biggest mistake most people make that they're not thinking long tail. And what I mean by that is you can't get too drunk on your success and you can't get too nervous, scared, uh, working out of scarcity when, you know, when the peaks and the valleys happen and they do happen in every business. I mean, let's think about this. 2001, Apple was just about out of business. They were ready to file bankruptcy before they hired Steve Jobs. Hmm. And now we fast forward 17 years later, and they're, I don't know if they still are, but they're the most powerful, biggest company in the world. Yeah. I mean, they were on their last breath, right? And that's, that's the osmosis. So part of the, the challenge is being mentally prepared to do that. Secondly is one of the things that everybody watching this, you must do is, you know, skinny down your lifestyle. If you're going to go off on your own for the first time, skinny down your lifestyle. Make sure in the bank you have at least one year's worth of expenses paid for. Mm. Right? So this isn't what most people will probably tell you on these podcasts, but this is the truth. So there's nothing worse than you go out to be an entrepreneur and suddenly you're running out of money. Mm. That affects how you sell. That affects how you market. It affects how you sleep. <laughs> I mean, when you got bills to pay and there's no money coming in, then it's tough. But give yourself a one year runway. If your expenses are, well, you're in Europe, right? Yeah. If your expenses are 2,000 pounds a month, then you better make sure you have at least 25,000 in the bank, untouchable money, mm -hmm. so that you can go operate your business and do it in the right way, not thinking short term. You start a business and I gotta go sell, I gotta go sell, I gotta go sell. That makes things very difficult. But if you can do it and build your business playing the long tail, so you don't have to close every deal, some deals flat out take longer. Hmm. And you have the certainty and the confidence knowing that you've got runway and then as money comes in, there will be this cascading point where you're getting far more money than the money you're making. Then take that money, and put it away. Not all of it. I mean, let's face it. If you would have told me at 30 years old that, you know, I wouldn't, if I made more money, I wouldn't drive a nicer car. I would have told you were crazy. <laughs> <laughs> I, I really thought in my thirties and early forties that, you know, having the cars and the trucks and the rovers and the big house and the, all this stuff was going to make me happy. I found out it didn't. However, at 30, that's all I thought about, especially if you grow up poor, then all you can think about is having the good stuff. Oh, yeah. I found that getting the good stuff didn't fulfill me and make me happy. Mm. So my point is, is that when you make the move, make sure you have runway. Make sure if you leave your company that you exit in the most professional manner possible because you never know if you might have to go back. So keep your, you know, play the long tail in your relationships. And then third, have your plan. Have everything ready to go so the day you leave, you're off and running. Your website goes up. Whatever it is you do, your social media stuff, your, your products are ready to go. Um, that would be the advice I'd give somebody who's considering it. That's great advice. And, and for people in the audience, I think that is a very solid 
plan that Gene shared with us because you will hear lots of things where people say, just go for it, just go for it. But if you leave your secure job, you become an entrepreneur and then you can't bring the money in, your business is not taking off and you actually have to go back to your old job to just keep the money coming in, then it, it's just completely pointless. So I think that's, that's really, really solid advice, Gene. Thank you for sharing that. Um, you've worked with some really high level mentors. There's fireworks going on. Goodness, that was really loud. Um, <laughs> um, you've worked with some really high level mentors like Tony Robbins, like Chet Holmes, like John Astroff and many others. You've worked with CEOs of Fortune 500 companies. I'm wondering what are some of the most powerful principles you have learned from them in terms of creating holistic success? Not just success in their business, but actually success in every area of their life. Because essentially that's what we really try and explore on this channel. A um, couple of things. One is, you know, one of the things I notice about all three of those people and some of the best CEOs, they're not just thinking one year out, they're thinking five years out. So they, their level of success is equivalent to the goals and dreams and desires they put themselves in the company. So that's one thing. So I always say, let's just do one year because I know that less than 10% of people have written goals. So I said, let's just focus on one year and see what happens. Those guys that are at the pinnacle they're already visualizing and deciding what five years out looks like, and then they reverse engineer and have patience in the tactical execution. Right. The other thing that I saw in all of them is the power of daily routine. Mm. Now, here's some routines they all do, and I know this for a fact because I've seen it. Tony, Chet, John Asaraf, Greg Reed, you know, I'm sure you know most of those names, and they have routines like, like Tony does a, what he calls priming in the morning. And all, here's all the commonalities. Uh, prayer and gratitude, reminding themselves of what they're thankful for, having mental clarity on what needs to happen that day. And it's usually three to five things that among all the things that are going to happen in their life, you know, we all get busy, the phone call comes in, the emails, whatever, but they have three to five things that they pre-identified in advance that will get done. Right, and if you study like Jeff Wood's work, they'd say, "What's the one thing?" Well, yeah. I find that you may have the the my one thing is being happy, but there's three things I got to do to achieve the one thing, right? Mm, so yeah. you can look at you know different uh, you know wrapping paper around the package, but I, I'm just this is what I per personally witnessed. Three is all of them do something from a health standpoint on a daily basis. So walking, exercising, working out, um, doing something with their kids, they all do something physically positive. So prayer, gratitude, meditation, daily priming in terms of clarity of outcomes so they don't just get through the day, they get from the day. And third, they do something physically, mm. right? So Chet was a little bit older, but he would go, he'd ha he, every day he had nine o'clock to 9.30 Pacific, you knew when I worked with Chet that I would not reach him because in that moment when he wasn't traveling, him and his wife would go for a walk. Wow. And it was infallible. He did not, that was like, like, like he had a doctor's appointment. He, you, you did not, he did not miss that. You know, mm -hmm. those little things that we take for granted. These, got, these super successful people are very, very good at executing the basics and having discipline towards the basic. It's not... There's no magical or mysteriousness about it. You know, I, some things I saw, like with Tony, we would do these business mastery events. And in some cases, we'd bring in experts. And maybe it was, and this is like 2008, 2009, when Twitter was just getting going. Facebook was just getting going. It seemed like a fad at that time. And we brought in social media experts. One of them was a guy named Gary Vaynerchuk. Which, yeah, yeah. You know, oh, yeah. Un unknown Gary Vaynerchuk had launched his wine library TV on YouTube and was becoming a Twitter sensation. Mm. I remember in that moment that I didn't know what a tweet was. I mean, it sounded really stupid to me. Why do I care if somebody's at the coffee shop and upset? You know, I just thought it was the stupidest thing in the world until, you know, Gary Vaynerchuk came in, Jay Abraham came in. And here's what struck me. While they were delivering really, like, stuff I had never thought of, I looked over and there's Tony Robbins in the audience with his journal, taking notes. You know what I mean? Even a guy that yeah. is the best of the best of the best of the best. Yeah. He's in the room learning at his own seminar. 
You know, that's another thing. John Asraf, the same way, always reading a book. If he's not reading a book, he's writing a book. Greg Reed, who's been in 26 books. Chet, same way. So, you know, I, I didn't plan to have this conversation, but now that I think about it, it those are the things they were doing. And it's, it's, it's something that everybody watching this can do now. Even if it's a podcast while you're walking the dog, something that's feeding your brain is it's so much easier now. 30 years ago, I'd have to buy the tapes and listen to them at night or in my car. Today, you can get five minutes waiting for an airplane or 30 minutes while you're flying or while you're at the gym working out or sitting in the sauna. But it has less to do with, less to do with the tactical part of it. It has everything to do with your mental and emotional commitment to strive for mastery in whatever it is. If it's playing the piano, if it's a sport, if whatever it is, you know, there's no excuse right now for whoever's watching this not to be progressing towards their ideal state or their dream life. Mm. There's no excuse. There's no shortage of information. There's no shortage of access to information. There's certainly enough experts out there. Do you know what's missing is the discipline to do it? And that's a commitment. Yeah. Is it easy? No. Is it easy? Everybody would do it. But if you're truly committed to being great, start by saying, I'm going to be great. And then yeah. set your goal, then reverse engineer it, then get into some simple, you know how long it takes to step outside and look up in the sky and think of the 10 things you're most grateful for in life? 15 seconds, maybe a minute. You gotta walk outside if you live in an apartment building. But to look outside and just say, thank you, Lord. That's easy, but mm -hmm. over the course of time, it has profound effect. Yeah. I love it. And, and there's that saying which says success is mastering the monotonous of the daily routines. Yeah. And, and here's what I'd say. So is mastery. Hmm. And you know, people have said, well, Gene's the sales master. He's the guru. And I'm like, here's one thing that I want people to get is mastery is never something you actually achieve. There's a misnomer about that. Mastery is a pursuit. Yes. Yeah. Right. It's, so it's I, even at, you know, I've been doing in, in sales in some form of that leadership, management, communication, whatever, I'm still reading the books. I'm still listening in the seminars. I'm, I, there's something, there's always something you can get. And if you can let that juice you learning and listening and watching and taking notes and writing things down so you remember them, you are going to see the fastest acceleration in your happiness, your life, your career, and your income than anything else I know. Mm, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, Gene, I, I have to talk about your book. Okay. This is the book that Gene's written. Right. The Sales Edge. Um, it's a best-selling book. Um, I bought it like a few weeks ago. I blazed through the whole thing in like a week and a half. It's <laughs> I have to say, it, it is mind-blowing stuff. It really is because I'm somebody who's, who's, who's kind of quite new to the sales and, and the business world. Um, but the way you share everything, the way you combine both the personal development um, side of things and also the business side of things is absolutely fantastic. The book is a phenomenal read and you have a tremendous amount of experience from 25 years of working with the best people in the world. And this book really just blew my mind. And, and I have to show, share this with the audience and you as well. I literally have a That's notepad awesome. full of just page after page after page after page of just notes that I've taken from the book. It is absolutely fantastic. Um, and I will highly encourage everybody in the audience to go and check it out. Um, but can you talk to us a little bit about the, some of the core principles. You talk about building rapport. Um, that was something really quite new to me. You also talk about mind reading and anticipation. So how are they applied, like the, the, some of the psychology there, how's that applied to actually getting clients? Because a lot of the times when you talk about sales, usually we think of a script. You're reading off a script um, and that's it but you go really deep in the psychology of how it actually works. How do you actually build rapport with somebody instantly? How do you actually use things like mind reading and anticipation to deal with objections? And I'm just really curious how you actually, how do you actually bring those two together? Well, it's, it's what my, 
life work has been. So it's not, there's no hyperbole in that book. And I think what you found to allow, it's a super easy read. Yes. Right. Yeah, so it's, absolutely. It's not a lot of science and data. It's like, this is what I have found to work. And here's why I've, what I, my journey to get there. Here's some mistakes I made and here's how I fix those mistakes. But the, I had a couple of years of wanting to understand something called unconscious or non-conscious influence. Um, I studied something called NLP, neuro linguistic programming, brain language programming, because I was constantly, as we talk about, you know, quote unquote, in the pursuit of mastery, I was like, I wanted to look at all facets of this. And, you know, all of, all of it came from studying something, applying it, seeing what works, and keeping what works and throwing out what doesn't work. Mm. So the precedence is pattern recognition or what's called um, sens like sensory acuity. Like if you read human body language, human communication patterns, how they think um, based on their title, based on male versus female versus uh, age versus what they do, there's you can anticipate certain things that they're thinking about and this is why anticipation is power especially in the business to business selling world you can anticipate somebody by title has certain preference points certain pains they have and certain patterns of achievements that they're responsible for achieving so you know when you say a sales script is you know yeah i believe in sales scripts but if they're poorly written sales scripts, it's not going to matter how much you say the wrong thing to the right person. You're yeah. not going to get the door open. Hmm. So it's, it's one thing to give sellers something to say. It's another thing to really think through the science of language patterns to get the attention of the right person. Yeah. And it depends on what you're selling or what you're trying to do. But, um, you know, like you talked about, you know, wanting to be an entrepreneur and this is kind of, my guess, by mind reason, this is kind of your side hustle. One day, this will be your full time hustle, and you'll you'll gain the ability to move away from the working for somebody and having a base salary to where you get to create it created on your own terms, right? Yeah. So this I can pick that up from the limited conversation we've had. So I would want to garner my communication around that. So most people make the mistake of communicating in one form, and that's their own form. And the truth is there's between six and eight different personality types of people you're going to communicate with. So if you only communicate in your own pattern, you're only going to be impactful for you know, less than 10% of the people you communicate with. Hmm. The people that are effective communicators are, are good at reading the body language, anticipating the patterns of the other person and adapting themselves to, to match or mirror the communication patterns, the wants, the desires, and the goals of the other person. That's when you get some level of a two-way meaningful relationship. And by the way, rapport and trust are the basis for any relationship to be longstanding, especially if I'm trying to sell something to you. If you don't trust me, if I come off as a sleazy salesperson, I can have the greatest thing in the world. It's unlikely you're going to buy it. Mm, that is very true. Very, very true. Um, and for people in the audience, I will highly encourage you to go uh, and check out The Sales Edge. It's available on Amazon um, and uh, I believe it's also available through your website, thesalesedge.co. Yeah, actually, I'm getting some funky things on my computer. Actually, for everybody watching this right now, I've arranged to have a download of a download a chapter for free. Oh, awesome. So, you know, give it a test drive and there's no... I'm not asking, you know, give me your credit card or you pay for shipping. I'm not doing, I don't do any funky funnel hacking stuff. It's just not for me, but I want to make sure everybody who watches this, they can go to it's the sales edge.co, the sales edge.co and put in your name and your email address and you will get emailed a link or you'll have a chapter, which I think is one of the, one of my favorite chapters is the edge for, the edge is the sales edge, but edge is an acronym of how to ask the right questions in the right psychological order to understand what you need to understand before you try to sell anything or present an idea. You got to educate yourself on the person. You've got to develop a gap. What are they trying to do that they're not getting to or what are the problems they're trying to solve? You've got to create a greater gap. What does it mean in the future to have this solved or what's it going to mean if you don't? And you've got to have some form of emotional connection. What is the story of somebody else? 
like them that took the action and got the result. Hmm. And this is, this is proven, not just from my personal experience from thousands of others, that most of you, if you're in sales or you're going into your boss to ask for a raise, you're not even going in with a roadmap. And like anything, you've got to have a roadmap of which to follow to get to your end result. And if you have the roadmap, you can navigate the territory, right? So if somebody you know, disrupts the meeting or takes the meeting in a different direction, you can navigate the territory, but get back to the road get roadmap. If there's going to be no gap, there's going to be no sale. What does it mean to have this done? What will it mean to not have this done? Who else like them have I helped get the outcome? So you share a story. This is all predictable based on the patterns of human behavior and the patterns of how we listen, hear, and get things we want. A great seller is able to adapt it to being able to do that. Beautiful. Um, and Gene, you know what? I, I love to stay on, but I know that we are restricted on time. Um, so I just before we wrap up, just quickly on how can people reach out to you? How can they find out more about you? And uh, you've already talked about the books. I'll put all the all those links below in the description. But how can how can people reach out to you? Send me a note directly, Gene G E N E at my company, which is called Growth Smart. Gene at GrowthSmart.com. One of the fastest way to get access to resources, videos, this, I send a ton of stuff out for free, is go to the, the salesedge.co and once you get registered, no, and I don't spam people, you're not gonna get three emails a day, you're gonna get one a week tops. And if it's a new video that I did, if it's new content I created, you can also find the same videos and content on LinkedIn, Gene McNaughton, Instagram, Gene McNaughton, Facebook, Gene McNaughton, my name. So you can DM me at any of those channels. I still respond to all the DMs. I try to interact with every comment that gets made because you know engagement is everything. And um, I take that very seriously. In fact, it's, I'm passionate about it. It's fun. I've met so many people that somebody read an article and made a comment and then I respond to them. They're like, oh my God, is this actually you? And I'm like, yeah, it is me. <laughs> yeah. Um, right? Because that, I owe that to them. I owe it to you to do this webinar. You sent me a note and said you read my book and I'm like, how can I help you? You talked about this podcast and here we are, right? You're going to find in life this law of reciprocity, which says the more you do for other people, the more stuff that comes back to you. Mm. So I live for, like you just showed me that notebook of all the notes you took. I live for that stuff. You don't, yeah. by the way, everybody, you don't get rich on a book. You know, you, the book sells for $16 US and I think I make four or five of that after distributors and printing and all that stuff. You don't get rich on a book. You get rich on the feedback from the book that drives you to go serve more people. And that's what it's all about. Absolutely. And, and in terms of reaching out, you, you're right. You, you, you did respond to my messages. To be honest with you, the first time I actually sent you a message was on the 6th of December, 2016. That was the very first conversation we had. So this interview has been two years in the making. Two oh years. my God. <laughs> I didn't respond and shame on me. No, no, no. It, it was just a back and forth. We tried to arrange stuff before it, it didn't quite work out, but I'm glad that we managed to do that today. Um, but you're absolutely right. The, the, the thing is that whatever you have talked about in this book, um, it has application to much wider than just sales. Because at the end of the day, we're all trying to convince other people of something every single day, regardless of whether we're in a sales capacity or not. So it might be just you know convincing your boss to give you that promotion or asking your kids to go to bed and brush their teeth because they're jumping on the bed, right? And, and bringing the house yeah. down, right? Or, or is it maybe just convincing your spouse to like, go away for the weekend? Whatever it is, you're always trying to persuade people. And that's what this book really teaches you, the, the, the principles of persuasion and influence. And I love it. So it has you know, application in much wider uh, capacity as well. But with that, Gene, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. I'll, I'd love to carry on, but I know we're restricted for time. Um, is there anything we can help you with right now? You know what? Spread the word. Spread the link. You know, I, I want to get this content to every corner of this earth because I believe it's right. I believe it's here's what I do know to be true. It is the best of every single thing I've learned in 26 years. And that doesn't factor in the four years while I was in school and I worked at the mall selling shoes and selling jewelry or whatever. But it's it's almost 30 years of intense passion about one subject, which is sales, influence and persuasion. 
So whether you're 18 years old or 68 years old, you're going to get a lot out of this book. And I'm not pumping the book. I'm pumping the knowledge. Mm. And it's, it's how I repay Tony Robbins and Zig Ziglar and John Assaraf. All of them said to me, not Zig, I didn't know him personally, but Tony and John, I did. All of them said to me when I said, how can I pay you back? And they said, go impact the lives of others. Mm. They, that's what they said to me. I'm saying this to you. Go serve other people. Yeah. Yeah. That, I mean, how cool is that? They didn't say go sell something <laughs> or go buy something or go do something for me. They said go impact the lives of others. Pretty, pretty good info from some pretty big people. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I uh, love it. Absolutely love it. Um, so, guys, there you have it. Our conversation with Gene McNaughton. Um, he is absolutely world class. And uh, I am just so honored uh, and so blessed to have him in my life, to connect with him and to do this interview. Um, seriously, I, I never thought it would be possible that I'll be sitting here with Gene doing this interview for you guys. Um, I generally want to thank Gene and I also want to thank you guys for taking the time to be here with us. Make sure you go and take action. Okay, at the end of the day, that's what it's all about. Go ahead and take action. I challenge you that everything that you have learned, everything that Gene's talked about, um, I've been taking notes. I always take notes. Okay, so check this out. This is These are my notes from this interview. I'm going to be going away and taking action on those. What are you going to be taking action on? Apart from that, make sure you guys hit the subscribe button. It helps the channel grow and allows me to bring on more amazing guests like Gene and also enters you in the monthly channel competition. Uh, and also make sure you share these conversations with other people who you think can benefit from these. But with that, make sure you guys stay awesome, hustle hard, like it says back there, and I will catch you in the next one. Thanks, Gene. Wow, you're the man. Thanks, brother. Talk to you later, buddy. You too.